Okay, good morning everyone and thank you for coming. Dr. Janet DeMille, the Medical Officer of Health and Chief Executive Officer of the Thunder Bay District Health Unit, will be providing an update on the evolving COVID-19 situation and the work that is ongoing. After Dr. DeMille's planned remarks, there will be a 15 minute period where questions will be taken from the audience. So please welcome Dr. Janet DeMille. So um, I, uh, I just want to uh, thank you for all, all of you for being here today. It's, um, I know you've had a lot of questions and, and I've tried to sort of answer some of those questions, but we've been very busy in the last week, so I really appreciate the opportunity for you to, to come here and uh, we can have a bit more uh, conversation and discussion about uh, the pandemic and what's happening in, in Thunder Bay. So I'm just, uh, I'm going to begin. So I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Janet DeMille, Medical Officer of Health of the Thunder Bay District Health Unit. And I want to talk to you about the COVID-19 pandemic, where we are now, and the implications for the Thunder Bay District. As you may recall, the world really became aware of this novel coronavirus in late December 2019. Very quickly, in early January, a lot started to happen that helped us learn about and understand the virus, how it is spread, and the containment measures that were happening globally wherever it was spread to. You'll recall, of course, the significant efforts in China where the virus originated. In Canada, in early January, the public health system quickly activated with local, provincial, and national agencies closely linked and collaborating across sectors. Public health, sec uh, public health experts from across the country came together to learn, to understand this evolving situation and to develop guidance and direction for public health, healthcare, and other areas. As well, at the national level, through the Public Health Agency of Canada, there's a strong connection with the World Health Organization and a system of information sharing. So countries and provinces had a good understanding of what was happening in various areas of the world. In Canada, containment efforts kicked into full gear very early. And we have seen the results of that in this country. In fact, I would like to acknowledge in particular the significant work done in Toronto that has managed to contain the virus despite increasing numbers of cases. Here at TVDHU, we have been involved right from the beginning, connecting with other health units and provincial partners like the Ministry of Health and Public Health Ontario to learn and understand about this new virus and the situation as it evolved. All the while, we were thinking about the implications for the Thunder Bay District and we were engaging in our own preparedness activities. In the last two weeks, however, the situation seemed to rapidly evolve with significant and unexpected events seeming to happen on a daily basis. The broader spread of the virus, the very challenging situation in Italy, and increasing cases in the United States we have reached the tipping point. And this was with the official declaration uh, of the World, from the World Health Organization that it is actually a pandemic, really confirms that. Increasingly, over this time, since like January, as the medical officer of health, I have been moving away from considering if the pandemic will impact us here to when it will come here. The shift in my thinking was reinforced particularly by the events in the last two weeks. I would say that we are no longer in normal times. We can't see it that way and we need to be informed and we need to prepare. So what I want to talk about today I'm hoping to give you an overall picture of the pandemic and to address some specific issues like travel, for example. I want to tell you what you can do, what we all can do, in fact, to mitigate the impact here, how we can collectively prepare. I'll give you some reasons why we might feel, why we can feel a bit reassured, 
and why I have confidence that working together and doing things collectively, we can mitigate the impact here in the Thunder Bay District and beyond. At, TB, so, um, at TBA DHU, we have given careful consideration to how the virus might arrive in our community. Uh, of course, it would be no surprise to you that it would likely come through travel uh, and certainly Toronto would be one place that it might come from. We've considered that if there was broader spread in the community in Toronto, that that would put us at greater risk of having community spread here. I was always relieved that Toronto seemed to be containing the virus. Uh, as well, there's uh, increasing international locations and travelers coming from those locations can also bring the virus here. And more recently, I have been concerned about what's happening in the United States. And I'm going to get to that in a little bit. I want to show you uh, this is the sort of phases of a pandemic. So I want to talk about the first phase, that being containment, which is the first phase in the response of the pandemic. In this phase, the goal is to quickly identify individuals who had COVID-19, these would be cases, and identify in in individuals who may have been exposed to that person when they were infectious. Those are contacts. And putting, uh, quickly putting in place the precautions to ensure that, that they are not further spreading the virus to others. Through this kind of approach, we can limit the spread to a few, few closely related individuals and prevent further spread into the community. That is what we at Public Health are prepared to do here. Since the start, we have been working closely with the hospital to ensure good communication and collaboration so that someone who may be at risk of having COVID-19 is identified, tested, and managed appropriately to reduce the risk of any further spread. People with some risk have been identified and tested. None have been positive for COVID-19. We have no confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the Thunder Bay District at the present time. We also have no concrete indication at this time that the virus is spreading in the community. We remain in containment mode. If we were to get a case in Thunder Bay, let's say today or this weekend or next week, we would approach it the way I have just outlined. There is a lot of value in being in containment mode, whether here or in Canada more broadly. It buys us time to prepare. This approach does rely on people coming forward and identifying themselves as potentially having risk factors for being exposed and then taking the appropriate precautions to not transmit the virus to other people. We have seen that in Ontario and we have seen that in Thunder Bay, particularly with people with certain travel related risk factors. So now I want to talk about travel. And I want to start off with uh, that I do not recommend that anybody travel outside of Canada at this time. The safest thing for you and for this community is to not have people and a lot of people traveling outside the country where they can get exposed to COVID-19 and potentially bring it back here. This is partly because of the increased number of cases in various parts of the world. It is no longer confined to very specific areas and therefore any international travel could be risky. I want to express particular concern about any travel to the United States. Over the recent months, the United States had problems with their testing kits and their rollout of their testing program. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, 
the, num the total number of tests done in the United States was just a little bit higher than the total number of tests done in Ontario. Now, the U.S. has started to correct that problem, and there is now a greater rollout of the tests, and all states can now test for the virus. Uh, however, we are seeing an increase in confirmed cases where people have been tested, and I do expect that over the next one to two weeks, a true picture of what is really happening in the United States will become clearer. If you do choose to travel internationally, there are three things I would like you to do. I would like you to be informed, be prepared, and be mindful. Be, for, be informed. Check the Government of Canada website that is updated regularly around the travel advisories of, of the various you know, countries and areas in the world. Check it even if you're, when you're on, uh, when you're in another country. Be prepared. Consider what you would do if you get sick somewhere else. Consider what you might need to do and the challenges you may face in getting back here if this is your home. Be mindful when you come back to this area. There will be expectations regarding travelers returning from other areas. You may have to self-isolate for two weeks. You may have to monitor. There will be an expectation that you follow up if you start getting sick. So I want to, to go back to um, the idea of containment. Because at some point, uh, we have to recognize that many times containment no longer works. This may be when there are a higher number of cases and contacts, and it's very challenging when they don't, the resources are limited, or when it becomes challenging to clearly identify individuals who may have been exposed, given the increasing risk factors and uh, risk areas globally. When containment stops working, we move into the mitigation and response phase of pandemic work. In this phase, the virus increasingly starts spreading among people in the community. Is this in some ways similar to what happens to flu every year, which is a different virus? From a public health perspective, there are two main goals we want to achieve as a community when there is a pandemic. The first is to delay the onset of having cases here and having community spread here. And that is done through that containment strategy, aggressively tracking down people and following up on, on those who may have been exposed. I spoke to that before. The second goal of, um, occurs in the mitigation and response phase. In this phase, we want to slow the spread of the virus in the community. This is also, in epidemiological terms, called flattening the epi curve. Uh, and you might hear that language coming forward because I've, I've already seen it in a number of different places. With a new virus like this one, nobody is immune. It is an infectious virus. It can eas fairly easily pass from one person to another if people are in close contact to one another. So when it starts spreading in the community, the number of people infected can increase very quickly in a short period of time. That can be quite a surge. This is a virus and a disease that will, will cause serious health issues in 15 to 20% of people who get infected. They will require hospitalization, and some will require intensive support only provided through an intensive care unit. This can completely overwhelm the health system and the hospital. This is really the number one reason why we need to have to control the spread when it starts spreading in this community. 
There are individuals who will be at higher risk of having that severe illness. These include older individuals, like over the age of 60, and individuals with underlying medical conditions. These are our parents, our grandparents, our family members, and our fellow community members. We have a collective responsibility to ensure that that doesn't happen and that the healthcare system can maintain full functioning. So I now want to get into the measures that we can take both as individuals and as communities. I'll start off with the individuals and I know you've already probably al already heard this over and over again. But if you can imagine how the virus is going to transmit, if you can imagine all the interactions, one person and another person that occur in this city every day, there are millions of those interactions. I've already had at least 20 this morning. Uh, all of those interactions can result in the virus transmitting from one person to the other. But there's a lot of things that we can do to prevent that transmission from happening. You know, the, the, the one about coughing and, and sneezing in your sleeve. When we cough or sneeze, droplets containing the virus are expelled into the air. And if somebody is standing close, you know, within a meter or so, they might get, you know, hit by those droplets. Uh, they also fall and land on surfaces, uh, usually within about a one to two meter range. So cover your cough so that that doesn't happen. It doesn't go to somebody else and it doesn't go down on the surface. Of course, washing your hands. We constantly touch things. That can contaminate our hands. Now having the virus on your hand is not gonna get you infected. However, when we use our hand and we touch our face, particularly our eyes or nose or mouth, that can result in the virus entering our respiratory tract and causing the infection. So it's very important to keep your hands clean, to wash with regular soap and water will do. And wash them well and frequently covering all parts of the, of the hand. When water and soap isn't available, hand sanitizer can work as well. And of course, avoid touching your face. Uh, avoid sick people. I'd say don't hang out with them. <laughs> Consider other ways of engaging, like over the phone or through FaceTime. There's so many ways these days. Also, if you're out somewhere and you're around somebody who seems to be sick, keeping at least a two meter distance from them can help reduce that spread. If you are sick, stay home. Don't go to work. Don't hang out with other people. You won't be exposing anyone else to the virus that you have. Clean, commonly touched surfaces, the doorknobs, handles, phones, remotes. We can pass the virus to one another through that way too. Don't forget to clean your cell phone. There's other ways of risk, uh, reducing risk exposures and preventing the spread of these germs. Avoid shaking hands. Use alternate greetings instead. Reduce your exposure to crowded places. We could also avoid gathering together. Meetings can be done through teleconferences or through Skype. We should also consider canceling or deferring gatherings and events especially when large numbers of people may come together. That could really result in a lot of transmission of this coronavirus. So I would really encourage you to start considering how you, all of you, as individuals and families can implement these measures. In addition, think of what you have planned for over the next several months and consider what changes you can make Consider deferring trips, family events, or other social events you may have planned. When this is over, and it will be over, you can reschedule these things. All these things really matter, especially if we're all doing them. I also
also want to touch on though the broader community measures that can be instituted that can slow uh, spread of the virus in community. These community public health measures are very significant measures that can cause more social disruption and even can have an economic cost. But they can be really beneficial in turning the tide and slowing the spread of the virus. We must get used to the idea that these things could happen and that we will have to adjust and adapt and get through them. These are temporary measures that are put in place to broadly reduce social interactions in many different areas and places. These include uh, cancelling mass gatherings, uh, cancelling events or deferring events, closing workplaces or schools, and restricting travel. These are often uh, called um, sorry, social, social distancing. <laughs> sorry. Ah, you guys know it better than me. Good. Um, so I encourage, I encourage you to, to think how you might prepare for those. So I've said a lot of heavy things today, but I also want to provide you some points of reassurance. First of all, the majority of people who get infected will have a fairly mild or moderate illness. People will usually be able to remain at home convalescing and they should be clinically better in about two weeks. And the good news is, it seems that once you've had it once, you won't get it again. The other piece of good news is that children are not impacted too much by the virus. They don't seem to get very severe illness. I will note though, that children are very good at transmitting the virus. So we have to be mindful of that. So I want to just touch on, in my final sort of comments, um, some of the work that we here are doing at the Thunder Bay District Health Unit. So we continue to work with various um, partners in the health care sector, including the Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Centre, Primary Care, EMS, and the Community Paramedicine Program, among others, uh, to ensure that we're responding effectively and collaboratively to this unfolding situation. We continue, we, we have a very key role in managing individuals who are being tested who might be at risk. We are informed at the provincial level when there's somebody through a travel or a cruise related um, issue as who's come from here who may be at risk and we do we do a lot of follow-up on individuals being tested individuals who may have been exposed and certainly are prepared to follow up on any of the contacts we are dealing with a huge amount of inquiries from various sectors as well uh, we continue to we are engaging long-term care homes social services schools and workplaces. We're also well connected with municipalities, most notably the City of Thunder Bay, and working very collaboratively with them as we approach this together. We are committed to keeping you up to date through our website and social media, and there's a lot of information on that. I also have some connections with First Nation partners, including First Nations and Inuit Health Branch, the Sioux Lookout First Nations Health Authority and others, and meet with them to prepare their responses. I would like to end this on a personal note. I am a medical officer of health, but I'm also a mother. I have a family. I have dealt with aging parents and grandparents and I'm a community member, a resident of Thunder Bay. I can understand how uncomfortable this can be to feel like we're potentially gonna experience a significant impact as a result of a pandemic. It's easy to feel fearful, anxious, to worry. I do want to say though, 
and, and I, I, the other thing is it can be uncomfortable to hear about what's happening in other countries. I do want to say though that I think we have reason to be optimistic. I would encourage everybody to remain calm and be mindful and to prepare. There are a lot of things that we can do as individuals, as families, and as a community to prepare for this and we can have a good outcome. And the best news is, regardless of what happens, it will end. It will end. We will become immune or the virus will reduce spread and it will go away. And so it, whatever happens, it will end. So I'm gonna end, end my comments there. Yeah, so now okay. we'll just open the floor for questions of Dr. DeMille, and we also have um, some other representatives from the health unit, if she can't answer the question. <laughs> Lance doesn't need a mic. <laughs> <laughs> Is it okay if we do this? If yeah, I'm tightening up the shot. Go there. So it's, so is, cool. the, is the speaker off? No. Oh, okay. Oh. Is there going to be feedback? Speaker's on, should right? Be, speaker's on, should be all right. Okay, good. Already. Perfect. Sorry. Um, so, so you've given us a lot of information here, but um, just the, the World Health Organization declaring the pandemic yesterday. Did that change anything at all here on the ground in Thunder Bay? No. No, it's, it's, it's just really describing what's happening globally and uh, that it was really heading that way and it, it doesn't change anything. Uh, there's some information here, um, but uh, the protocols for the people who were at the mining conference in yeah. Toronto, um, if you detail those a little bit, and, and also uh, there was uh, on social media last night, we heard that the, the person from Sudbury was not contagious at the time that he was at that conference. That's have true. you heard that? And can you explain yeah. that development? So um, what you're referring to is the case that was diagnosed in the Public Health Sudbury and District's health unit area. And it was an individual who had spent a couple of days at that particular mining and prospectors conference in Toronto. And uh, we heard about it. Uh, we have very good collaboration across Northern Health Units and we were informed very quickly because of that, because of the, they recognized the implications for, because of the mining industry across Northern Ontario. Um, and then we, the Public Health and Sudbury and Districts and likely the provincial partners are also following up to really understand the potential risk associated with that convention. And so there's a lot of work that's still ongoing about that. But yes, we were informed that that individual was eight, had um, was not infectious at that conference. So any you know anybody who would have had interactions with them at that time would not be at risk of having been exposed. However, I think the the issue is that they're not sure where that individual actually acquired COVID-19, and it could have been through somebody else at the conference who was infected. And we're waiting to hear more information. Uh, as far as the testing for it, if somebody comes forward and tests, is the test done here in Thunder Bay, or, or do you send it away and then it comes back? Uh, so when the test is done, for example, if a, this is an individual who might be tested and let's say it's at the Thunder Bay Regional, uh, the test would be done there and then the test goes down to the lab in Toronto, the public health lab, that's when it's done. However, the public health labs are expanding uh, in terms of where the testing can be done and I believe hospitals, it's also expanding to certain hospitals as well. It's just part of the evolving process of our response. What's the turnaround on that? So I think the turnaround uh, is about, it can be like two to three days before we, we get the result. I think it has been as long as three days, but sometimes it's shorter than that. I would say though, anybody who is tested, we are informed about and they are self-isolating. 
So if they're in identified as at risk, they go home and they stay there until the test result comes back and we, we support them in that and provide them the results. And how will media be notified if we do have a positive case? Uh, we will issue a, a media release around that, similar to what Sudbury did. Will we quickly, or what's the time frames around that? Do you uh, we would aim to do that fairly quickly because I know, you know, rumors start. Just speaking what? of rumors, how difficult is it to to sort of have to navigate, say, social media, people posting things about suspected cases at the hospital, quarantine rooms being set up? How is say people should remain calm, how does that make that more difficult? Well, I think, uh, I think there's a lot of stuff on, on social media, whether it's the rumors or others, things that can kind of exacerbate the fears and anxieties that people have, and that's really unfortunate. But certainly can encourage everybody to go to credible sources of information about it, and maybe not believe everything that they read, including rumors about what's happening. Um, uh, getting back to the testing, um, it, it, could you kind of walk people through that for people who don't know, where do you go to get that testing first of all, and who should be getting tested and when should they be getting tested? Should it be, you know, if they start to feel some flu-like symptoms, or should it before that? Yeah. So that's a that's a broad question because it really depends on what somebody's particular risk is. So we, if there's returning travelers and they get symptoms, the health unit plays a key role in that. And uh, there's also a 1-800 telehealth number that has recently been expanded to handle calls. So if an individual, for example, has been advised to self-isolate because they've come from Iran or um, China, uh, they might be self-isolating at home if they get, uh, and we would be aware of them and we would be following. If they get symptoms, they would contact us and we would facilitate the assessment and testing for them. Uh, similarly, people who might be self-monitoring, like a returning traveler from certain areas of the world, uh, they would be calling us or telehealth and be referred. I think that is an area that um, that is kind of we're working on with the Thunder Bay Regional, actually, in terms of the, ac the access to testing so, so that it's, it's fairly easy and um, uh, accessible kind of mode so people can get assessed and, and uh, tested fairly quickly. Uh, I heard out there that, that, that actually you, most people should not be going to the, the hospital uh, because most people don't need to. You don't want to overwhelm the yeah. health system, as you mentioned. Is yeah. that accurate? Uh, you should go to the hospital if you feel you need urgent care. So if somebody has really significant shortness of breath or, you know, or maybe complicated medical kind of issues, uh, for sure, but most people, if they have, you know, if they start feeling a cough or a cold and they maybe don't have underlying medical, they should just, they could phone us or telehealth and we'll support that into, and stay home and self-isolate and we'll support that individual in accessing testing and uh, assessment. Any advice for, um, for schools with how they should be monitoring this? Yeah, so we, um, that's one area that we're focusing on as well, uh, and sort of daycare schools and college and university. So there is guidance documents that have been produced by from schools. Uh, so our school nurses are getting familiar with that. We pass that on to schools, uh, and we do have a healthy schools team, which is nurses and a manager, and working with them to kind of get that message out. And that's something that that's ongoing. We we we. We want to do more of that, more engagement with the schools. We're providing them information, but every school in the Thunder Bay District has a nurse, and so there's good communication happening. You said that 15 to 20 percent of those uh, it infects uh, would be seriously impacted, and that this can overwhelm the hospital and health system. Yeah. Could you expand upon those comments, and particularly uh, with respect to the Sulaco catchment area? You said you're working with the, with the Sulaco First Nations Health Authority? So I'm certainly supporting the work that they're doing, and okay. uh, they're doing it with the community partners and the Minayawan Health Facility as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I think uh, that's a complicated question. Um, uh, okay, I, I'll, 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 I'll make it simpler then. Can you expand and clarify this can overwhelm the health system? So I think, uh, uh, I think First Nations and First Nations communities are another group that are at significant risk for this virus. 
I think there might be opportunities to be able to prevent viruses, that virus from going into those communities. And I think that that, that needs to be explored. And I'm happy to, to bring that to the table with them. Um, but certainly uh, uh, needing to be able to, needing the Health, um, not Health Canada, First Nations and Inuit Health, uh, to be able to meaningfully support assessment and treatment and, and management of cases and on First Nations communities is very important, given the number uh, and, and, uh, and the potential implications. These are individuals and communities at, at higher risk of having those severe complications. And do you have any concerns about the Thunder Bay Hospital? Um, I have... Uh, so, you know, I can think of different scenarios of might, about what might happen. And, you know, when you hear about what's happening in other areas of the, wor of the world, I, do, I would have concerns about any hospital and their capacity to be able to manage this. I do know that the Thunder Bay Regional, though, is, is on this. They're managing it. I've met with them. Um, we have a representative here, actually. But we're very well connected with them. And they've, uh, they're, I would say, my sense is fairly prepared and moving forward with further activities to continue that preparation. And I, I just, uh, I, I don't want to speak for the Thunder Bay Regional, but there is somebody potentially who could if you wanted to ask a question. Can I just ask you about, you, you said the gentleman in uh, Sudbury yep. wasn't, in, wasn't infectious. Um, what's the, you know, what's the curve of the virus? Where are you infected in it and how long does it generally last? So somebody gets exposed to the virus by their interaction with another person or, um, and then it takes, uh, there's an incubation period. So they, they, the virus gets in them, but they have no symptoms. And that's called the incubation period. And I think actually the studies from China show it's probably five to six days, but it could be anywhere from one to 14 days before an individual actually shows symptoms. And the symptoms might be fever, cough, and a, a shortness of breath or difficulty breathing. Uh, and so somebody can get exposed to the virus and go through, and the incubation period is usually a, um, no symptoms and not infectious. So, um, and that, so that could last sort of five days. So thinking about that person being at that conference probably wasn't coughing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and they would work, be, look and when did the symptoms actually start and kind of map it back and see when the infectious period was. Does that answer your I'm just wondering where, like, when people are at the most danger of giving it to other people, like when in that? When is when they start having symptoms. Okay, Especially so they're coughing, they're coughing. they're sneezing. Yeah, because if you imagine, um, you know, the, the, the infection has taken hold, it's a, a viral pneumonia, it has taken hold, and they're now having symptoms, and the coughing is what's putting them out there. When somebody's not coughing, lower, lower, Less, less likely for them to, to actually spread out. Perfect. Is this you know, even a sense of how many potential cases have been tested? Uh, I don't know. Fifteen. I mean, it's sort of under fifteen. Yeah. And once I just I we we have the numbers. <laughs> like I, and once people are tested and they're waiting for the results, do you recommend that they self-isolate or yes. is it business as usual? So if, a if they're seen by a clinician and it's deemed that they, they weren't having the test, they would be instructed to self-isolate until the test results come back. The people who have been tested, is there kind of a, a common reason why? Is it that they've, they've traveled or any other factor? Uh, I think it's mixed, really. Uh, you know, risk factors and then the symptom, that constellation. Can you just again reiterate uh, why your thinking has changed that it's going to come to Thunder uh, it's just really how what's happening globally and it's really expanded globally and uh, containment efforts are, are working in some areas to, to bring it back, but um, it's, uh, it seems to be hard to contain overall and, and just that, that pattern, especially of what's happened in there. It's, I'm not like 100% sure that it's going to happen here. I'd like to say no, <laughs> but uh, I think that's probably not realistic though. What lessons have we been able to learn from what's happened in Italy in terms of doctors and bed shortages and just an overall shutdown and, and an issue there? Yeah, 
I think we've actually, if I may broaden your question, but certainly in all areas, what happened in China, um, Dr. Bruce Aylward, who was a, a Canadian epidemiologist who led that mission to, for the World Health Organization in China, came back with a really a lot of information about what happened there. And I think uh, there's a good understanding at the WHO level and at the national even provincial level about what's happening and what's been successful and what's worked in various different countries. So I, I don't know how much is, is what's happening in Italy, but I think certainly people are very much aware of what's happening. There's a hockey day actually for the weekend. Is there any concern with you mentioned big events like that, or any advice for the for people that are attending that this weekend? Yeah. So I think that overall the risk for acquiring COVID-19 um, in Thunder Bay right now is still fairly low. I, I indicated before that we have no concrete indication that there's any community spread. Um, uh, now sometimes you can't tell if that's happening, but um, there doesn't appear to be. I, I would be com quite comfortable saying that. So I think a, a, like a hockey tournament that might be happening now is probably at, really, at, at lower risk of, of being an issue. However, going forward, if we have more broad community uh, spread, things like that, it might be worthwhile looking at not having them. So is it a matter of when then? Or we, or I would say it's a matter of when, yeah. Like we're to be realistic. Do you have any advice for um, the business community? I mean, I'm particularly I'm thinking, you know, small businesses that if they lose one or two or three employees, it could be yep. quite uh, detrimental to them. Uh, what would your advice be for those businesses? So I think there is a, a, a advice and recommendation out there for workplaces and businesses, um, and I think that's uh, that's a very good point. That what we call con continuity of operations or business continuity. We were even doing that here at the health unit. If our if some of our staff is sick, how are we going to manage? What do we need to make sure it still happens? What maybe would we have to put put aside to be able to do that? So I, I think each individual, each, each business or workplace really has to look at that and how they're how they're going to manage through that, and that might be, you know, a difficult time, for sure, and that may have you know consequences. However, as I said, it will end. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Demille for her uh, speaking. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time for today. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. If you found this video helpful, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, share this video, and keep up to date on what's going on.